Colorado calls for reinforcements, backup health care workers to replace those getting sick or getting exhausted fighting the pandemic. A doctor we know well gives us the inside story. COVID patients who are still convinced it's a hoax and families unable to be with loved ones in their final moments. The governor's pressure to keep kids in school did not stop the state's largest district from announcing it's clearing its classrooms. The cost of Christmas to take down a tree and get it from Colorado to the U.S. Capitol. And our state's smallest falcon in need of help sticking around finds it at a brewery. From my home to yours, this is Next. A quarter million Americans dead of COVID-19. 2,324 of them were Coloradans. We're losing about 20 more of our neighbors in this state each day. State health leaders now say the hospital system is feeling the strain. You know, imagine being a health care worker on month nine of this pandemic. We'll hear directly from one in a moment. So Colorado's preparing its new system that will help transfer COVID patients to the hospitals that have capacity. And the state's also calling in reinforcements for health care workers who catch the virus. We're also hearing from our hospitals that they are seeing more staff members sick with COVID in the last month than they have seen in the totality of this pandemic. This is creating serious staffing problems for our hospitals and exacerbating the stress that they are feeling. So to mitigate that, uh, the state EOC has activated our medical staffing contracts uh, to ensure that we can supplement hospitals and other healthcare facilities with critically needed staff when necessary. We have some questions into the state health department on where exactly they are finding extra health care workers right now, seeing that most every other state is in the same shape as Colorado or worse off, and imagine that they are also looking for help. An ER doctor who has treated thousands of COVID patients says this pandemic has changed her as a physician. Dr. Camilla Sasson returns to Next tonight to share what she calls the untold stories from inside the hospital. She spoke with Arnusha Roy. So I've been gone for about five weeks. Um, so Friday I get to go home and see my babies and my husband. Dr. Camila Sasson has spent much of the pandemic traveling around the country treating COVID-19 patients. And through the thousands of people she has cared for, she has had a heart-wrenching front row seat to COVID-19. Personal favorite patient of mine who I brought a caramel macchiato to every morning <laughs> because she was, she was a coffee drinker, she told me. And so I told her that I would bring her a caramel macchiato um, and, you know, she got sicker and sicker and you get, they become family because literally they don't have any family. So we as become their family as their healthcare workers, right? I'm going to cry. Oh my gosh. Um, and she ended up on the ventilator and, and transferred out and died, you know? And so, um, again, oh gosh, sorry. You get close to these patients. The emotional toll runs the gamut from COVID-19 deniers. I had a patient walk out on me when I told him he had COVID walk out and just say, um, and just say, it's not real. I don't know what you're talking about. And he left and you can't do anything, right? Like all I could do is tell public health. To being a patient's lifeline to family. And then you have the other end of the spectrum, which is making the phone call to a family member and to say, hey, look, just so you know, I'm, I'm taking care of your mom and she's not doing well. From the multiple hospital systems she's worked in, she has watched nurse after nurse fall sick, physicians taking over workloads and the pains of staffing shortages. And our, and our co-workers who are either getting COVID who are even in the same hospitals that we're treating, you know, they're, they're being treated by us. The fatigue is real for healthcare workers, which is why Dr. Sasson is hoping people who are not following the safety precautions will start sharing their same sense of personal responsibility. And if we don't have people stepping up and really sort of saying, look, you're right, I will do my very little part to make a very big impact. Um, we're not gonna be there to help you when you need it. For next, I'm Anusha Roy. Dr. Sasson's going to be back home for a week in th around Thanksgiving, but she's signed up to work in Colorado while she's here. It'll allow her to share some of what she's learned from working around the country with folks locally. Take a look at the hospitalization picture in our state right now. There are 1,428 people currently hospitalized with the virus. That's up 50 from yesterday. We were at 1,169 patients this time last week, and just think two months ago, 147 Coloradans in the hospital. Our positivity rate yesterday was about 12.5%. Seven-day average is now 12.8%, highest that it's been since our first wave in the spring. 
Congressman Doug Lamborn is the second member of Colorado's congressional delegation to announce that he is contracted COVID-19. His office says his symptoms are mild. Republican from Colorado Springs is now isolating at home. Ed Perlmutter's doing fine. He's in Washington. Colorado added a bit more than 4,000 new COVID cases yesterday. Our seven-day average is now more than 4,600 a day. It appears like we might be seeing cases plateau. I mean, they're plateauing at, at unbelievable heights, but it beats the alternative. Just one day after Democratic Governor Jared Polis encouraged school districts to keep kids in school, keep younger students in the classroom, even in the worst hit areas for COVID in our state, like Denver. One day after the governor said that, the state's largest school district said, nah, it's going all remote. I apologize, I had a malfunction there. Third graders and above are already learning remotely. Starting November 30th, kindergartners through second graders will join them through the winter break. Students have next week off in DPS for Thanksgiving. And days after they lost Superintendent Susana Cordova to a job down in Texas, DPS is number two, Mark Ferrandino is leaving to head the Colorado Department of Revenue. Uh, if you know that name, it's because he used to be Colorado's House Speaker. So our Marshal Zellinger spent his day searching for answers to a stack of your really good questions about how Colorado's businesses are supposed to handle the new wave of restrictions coming online in many counties. Will we have to go back to waiting outside to go into grocery and big box stores? According to the state's dial restrictions, critical retail should be at 50% capacity under level red. I asked King Supers about the possibility for waiting in lines outside again. A spokeswoman told me they've been operating at 50% and monitor the number of people inside through their infrared system that Steve Steger told you about a few years ago. The system that helps determine how many open registers are needed can also track number of people inside and send an alert to a manager when it gets to 40%. A Safeway and Albertson spokeswoman told me those stores are also at 50% and they monitor based on transactions and visual checks. PR responses from Target and Home Depot were similar. Even when it comes to new limits and restrictions, it's really on the honor system. Rather than moving towards, well, how are you going to enforce this? We ask that people comply. But before you start emailing me, hey, this business or that business isn't following the rules, you should reach out to your public health department, perhaps before your local media station. It really is the counties that are expected um, to enact and enforce those restrictions. Kate and Jan want to know how does the state's new color dial affect ski resorts? Loveland Ski Area posted on Facebook this afternoon that level red will still allow skiing, but not indoor dining and bar service. Then there's the question that will be the talk on Sunday. Why can the Broncos still have 5,700 fans when everyone is being told to limit Thanksgiving gatherings to one family? Is the variance that allows for Broncos fans being reconsidered? Doesn't sound like it because COVID apparently avoids those in the buddy system. The Broncos have been wonderful partners uh, throughout the course of this pandemic. Uh, we continue to be in conversations with the Broncos uh, to make sure that we are doing all that we can to keep everyone safe. I'll put a footnote on the Broncos thing. We've heard from the government. Thank you, Marshall. Weeks of this, we can't get it fixed. We've just, I, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. It might be easier at this point if, instead of getting Marshall a new technical setup, we just bought him a new home. We're going to get him a new home. Uh, it'll have new wires in it, and, uh, and it'll be fine. Uh, but appreciate that report from Marshall Zellinger. So, hey, $5 at a time, your word of thanks micro giving campaign has raised $1.7 million for Colorado's nonprofits. And for the next two weeks, we're going to focus on the issue of hunger in Colorado in collaboration with our annual Nine Cares Colorado Shares Food Drive. What we're going to do here on next together is a targeted effort for organizations that could use extra help fighting hunger in our communities. The word of thanks that comes to mind when I think of the Denver Indian Center is tradition. For almost 40 years, the Denver Indian Center has had a tradition of celebrating heritage while helping the most vulnerable in the native community. The food bank that's run out of that nonprofit's location in West Denver has seen a 400% increase in need during the pandemic. They're also unable to hold their traditional elders dinner due to COVID. So they're trying to find new ways to honor and support their elders. 
The Denver Indian Center is holding a drive up Thanksgiving dinner distribution open to anybody in the community this coming weekend. And I th thought maybe we could work together to replenish their food bank so they can continue to meet the enormous need that they're seeing clear through the holiday season. If you text the word thanks to 303 871 1491, I will send you that link to donate. As with every week, uh, if you're in for $5, I will match the first 50 of you at home who give that. We know that hunger is an issue across Colorado, and we are not going to solve it everywhere at once. But there's enough of us here that we can make a real impact for the Denver Indian Center and the Coloradans it serves. There is a beautiful tree headed from Colorado to the U.S. Capitol. Also beautiful is the fact that you don't have to pay for that. It's an answer to your next question. Then, a horse, a dragon, and Colorado's smallest falcon walk into a brewery. No joke, this is a legit environmental effort in northern Colorado. Next. Tonight's next question comes from a viewer named Greg. With the U.S. Capitol's Christmas tree coming from Colorado this year, Greg was curious how much it all costs and who pays for it. The 55-foot Engelman spruce was grown in the Uncompahgre National Forest near Delta. It was cut down earlier this month, and it's been on a tour across the country on its way to D.C. U.S. Forest Service estimates the cost to cut down the tree, transport it, and set it up at the Capitol is about a quarter million dollars. It's paid for by donations and sponsors, not you taxpayers. The tree arrives at the Capitol Friday, and it'll be lit early next month. <laughs> This is how our Wednesday started. Beautiful sunrise pictures coming in on the digital network tonight. And a day close to a record, 74 in Denver. The average high temperature should be closer to 51. There is a storm coming. A weak front comes through tomorrow. It's more of a dry front, so temperatures come down, but we don't see much rain or snow. A second stronger storm taking aim at us for later in the week that'll bring mountain snow Friday and maybe a rain snow mix to Denver Saturday. Certainly temperatures will be colder by the weekend, but between now and then we're dealing with with wind and not the moisture we need. Partly cloudy 42 tonight, tomorrow with sunshine. Temperatures in the mid 60s, a cooler day with that front coming through. Temperatures go even cooler Friday with a chance for rain and snow Saturday. Uh, it'll be kind of a cool and dry Sunday and then we're back to sunshine in 50s for the early part of next week. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a do-it-yourself auto repair. Lose your bumper? Bummer. Got a spare snowboard kicking around? Rad. Katie spotted this SUV in Longmont last Friday. I almost feel like you, you don't need a Colorado license plate if you have a, a snowboard for a bumper. Like the cops will just be like, yeah, 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 that's one of us. What just says Colorado to you? Share it with the rest of the class. Email next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. It's a cool experience to highlight what they're doing in our community and then also have some fun beers and learn about birds. <laughs> I've nested at a few breweries over the years. One in northern Colorado now has a stake in bringing back a bird that is struggling to stay in our state. Next. Kestrels are Colorado's smallest falcon, and their nesting habitat in our state has been disappearing. A pair of kestrels has found a new home and some help from a brewery. Inside Horse and Dragon Brewing Company, canning is underway. Just on the other side of that back wall, a tiny home is waiting for its family. You can see the Kestrel box up there on the, on the top of the air, old airplane hangar. It's empty now, but each spring for the past two years, a pair of Kestrels has nested there. Yeah, I didn't even know what a Kestrel was when I first spoke with uh, Scott, and so it's been great to, to learn about them and watch them. Carol Cochran co-owns the brewery. Purposely, there's a door on the right side and then that's how we extract the birds to be banded. And Scott Rashid directs the Colorado Avian Research and Rehabilitation Institute. He put the box up there. What's important for us as far as these little birds go is they are a kind of a pinnacle of the environment. When the kestrel population increases, it's a safe bet that their environment is stable. If their population decreases, something's going on lower in the food chain. And if we can create more and more of that perfect environment, we can then increase the number of these birds that need our help. The field behind Horse and Dragon is a kestrel paradise. And the habitat for kestrels is just big expanses of open uh, country. When they arrive, you can watch the birds on a webcam in the tap room. And Horse and Dragon brews a beer called Kestrel Run to celebrate the nesting. 
It takes about as long to ferment as the eggs take to hatch. Yeah, beer and kestrels are, they have a nice, um, a similar nesting pattern, I guess. <laughs> Kegs and kestrels might not seem like an obvious match at first, but the partnership has worked so far, and Carol and Scott are expecting a third pair of birds to move in come April or May. Hopefully it's a little bit of a template template for how we can live a bit more in harmony with, with wild things um, and help them in their nesting patterns. For next, I'm Brian Wendland. So Scott's got 100 of those boxes from Littleton up to Wyoming. You can't just like throw one in your backyard though. Kestrels need areas with wide open space. They prefer larger areas with unplowed fields nearby. If that happens to be your property, we have a link on how to request one of those bird boxes in this article on 9news.com. A chance to help Coloradans facing hunger right before the holidays. That and one of the spiciest pieces of feedback we've received in some time. Next. As part of Nine Cares Colorado Share's effort to fight hunger in our community each year, what we're doing on Word of Thanks this week is some direct support for a small food bank that's doing important work. The Denver Indian Center has seen its community's need quadruple since the start of the pandemic, and COVID's keeping them from holding their traditional elders dinner next month. If you text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, I'll send you that link to donate. We're going to try and restock the Denver Indian Center's food bank so they can continue to feed the families that rely on that longtime nonprofit on the west side of Denver. And as always, I'll match the first 50 donations of $5. So, you know, a whole slew of you asked Marshall to look into why the Broncos are still allowed to have thousands of fans at Mile High, just like they did earlier in the summer when the pandemic was at a low, while small businesses are facing increasing restrictions. And you heard in Marshall's story, one of the state health leaders say it's because the Broncos are, quote unquote, wonderful partners. Kenyon writes in, how does my wife's bar become wonderful partners as well? Sign up sheet? No. Okay, then I guess then we will just go without money to survive. If we're all in this together, Kenyon writes, we might feel differently, but apparently it's just a way the rich get to feel better about themselves. I would say this has become the number one thing that we are asked about these days at Nine News is about whether there is a very visible double standard on your television every Sunday. As I've said here before, I think there's a way that they can explain how this works in terms of small groups in an outdoor setting, but certainly the folks who are in charge of that setup and the folks at the state must know how it looks to everybody else out there. Be safe, make good decisions, protect your friends and family. I'll see you next time.